Welcome to this evening's Montpelier City Council District 3 Candidate Forum. This forum is sponsored by the Capital Area Neighborhoods, also known as CAN. CAN has been revitalized by the City of Montpelier and is supported by the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition. I'm Tom McCone, your moderator this evening. Social connectedness is a key element in resilient com communities and good communication and civic engagement are essential to making that happen. The purpose of this program is to foster such communication and civic engagement. In District 3, we have two candidates running for each of the two city council seats from that district. This evening's program provides an opportunity for those candidates to share why they are running to be on the council, and it gives you, the voters, the opportunity to ask the candidates questions. This is a forum for sharing ideas. It's not a back and forth debate. For those of you on computers, we suggest you select the gallery view. The view icon is at the top of your screen, and the chat icon where you can submit questions is at the bottom. If chat isn't already showing, move your cursor there and it should come up. If you have a technical question during the program, please put it in the chat and the Zoom manager will try to answer it. In a moment, I will introduce the candidates. After that, here's our format. The candidates will each be given up to two minutes to make opening remarks and to tell why they are running to be on the council. We will have two Q&A rounds. In the first, we will ask candidates questions combined, compiled, excuse me, from those that were submitted in advance. In the second, we will ask candidates questions compiled from those submitted this evening in the chat box. We will end by giving each candidate up to two minutes to make closing comments. During the format, during the forum, audience members will be muted. Two people from CAN will co collate questions to be raised in chat, being raised in chat, and will group them into questions for the second Q&A round. In order for us to have time to collate your questions, please submit them anytime up to the half point of the first Q&A. We ask everyone to be polite and respectful while using chat. Although we do not expect to need to do this, if anyone is out of line, they will be dropped from the session. Please note that Orca Media is recording this program and it will later be available on their website. All that said, let's meet our four candidates. Jean Leon and Jennifer Morton are running for a single year to finish out the two-year term which Gen to which Jennifer was appointed after Dan Richardson resigned. Carrie Brown and Alice Goltz are running for a full two-year term to replace Jay Erickson, Erickson, who has chosen not to run for re-election. For opening remarks, we will go in alphabetical order. For closing remarks, we will go in reverse alphabetical order. During the questions and answers, we will vary the order so no candidate is always first or last on the list. So now we'll move to opening remarks. And Carrie Brown, you're first. Thank you so much, Tom. And uh, thank you for the organizers of this event. I'm really appreciative of the opportunity to speak to everybody. And I'm so glad that we're all here. Uh, my name is Carrie Brown and I live on St. Paul Street and I have lived in Montpelier for 26 years on St. Paul Street for 22 years. And um, I have two sons, one of whom graduated from Montpelier High School. The other one is a senior at Montpelier High School. And so, and they've been all the way through, um, they were both born here and have been all the way through the school system. And um, in, my, in my professional life, my job is executive director of the Vermont Commission on Women, which is a state agency that's been working since 1964 to um, advance rights and opportunities for women and girls in Vermont. And I have a, a long career in Vermont of working in gender equity, in education, in nonprofits, in government. And um, I served on the Vermont Commission on, on Women before I was elected to be the director nine years ago. Um, and in my much of my life in Montpelier, I have been a justice of the peace. I'm currently a justice of the peace. 
And um, I have to say that a lot of people think the most interesting thing about being a JP is being able to marry people, uh, which is a lovely thing to be able to do. But I actually get much more excited by things like the um, property tax assessment appeals and um, election procedures and being part of all that. So um, there is, I definitely have an inner government geek inside me. And that is a huge part of why I'm interested in running for city council and being part of that because um, I'm really passionate in my belief that democratic government is just an ideal way for a community to express its values, to kind of pull its resources together, to make sure that everybody in the community is, has their needs met and that we are um, using our public resources to express the values of our community. Um, so I am eager for an opportunity to participate in that and that is why I'm here. And then just one other thing I want to mention is that um, my husband is John Odom, who is the city clerk in Montpelier. And um, uh, we have talked a lot about, and I've talked with other city councilors too, about the idea of, is there any kind of conflict of interest? And we have discussed the idea that when it comes time for the budget process, that the city clerk's budget could be pulled out of the rest of the city budget. And so that I could recuse myself if I were elected from voting on that portion of the budget. So I wouldn't be voting on my husband's salary, which doesn't, which sounds like a conflict of interest to me. <laughs> but other than okay. that, I don't see anything, so. Okay, thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Uh, Alice Golds, your second. Um, good evening, my name is Alice, my name is Alice Golds. I lived in Mount, Mount Hilliard District 3 for 12 years. I'm a, I'm a school crossing guard at the intersection of Main, Main and School Street by the Kellogg Hubbard Library. The reason why I am running for a seat on city council is to represent the people of District 3, most especially those who often felt they are either unrepresented or unrepresented on the council. I want, to, I want to speak to the people about their concerns as well as what they believe are unmet needs of the community and bring these concerns and needs to the table in order to help find practical solutions on behalf of District 3 residents. I want to say this is what the people need now, how do we make it happen? Okay, thank you, Alice. And I should have mentioned, you know, since I, I let Carrie go a little bit longer on her opening statement, if any of you would like to go a little longer, we can do that too, out of fairness. Okay, so Gene, you're, you're next. Hello, everyone. First, I'd, I'd like to say, uh, I wanna thank the Capital Area Neighborhoods Ken for hosting and uh, coordinating this first annual uh, debate um, forum, uh, public forum. I think it's uh, essential and, and just a prime example of, of the uh, reach out community engagement that this uh, community needs. Um, so thank you, Ken, for doing this and putting it together and organizing it all. It's uh, greatly appreciated, and, and this way the public could get involved as well and uh, raise their concerns. Um, I am a Berlin Street resident of uh, six years now. I've been in Central Vermont for about eight, ten years, give or take. Um, um, I have two children, 17, 14, two girls, amazing. Um, in another school district that they're here uh, half the time. Um, I am involved uh, in my community, uh, engaged with uh, the Central Vermont Recycling Center and Solid Waste District in collaboration. And, and, and I do a lot of volunteer work there. Um, I'm also a CAN neighborhood leader uh, up in this district. I'm also on the development review board for a few years. 
Um, so I'm, I'm really passionate about where I live and the concerns of uh, the community and our residents and uh, to be a proactive voice and, and reaching out and, and, and really addressing their concerns. Um, I'm also a local business owner and I'm also an independent contractor, artist. I'm a jack of many trades, but, um, and so the question is like, why I'm so busy and so involved and why, why do this, right? Um, well, uh, it's like any relationship one's in, you have to uh, really commit, dedicate, care and, and love, uh, most importantly. And um, I'm, I'm prepared to do so. so thank you for, this again okay thank you jean and uh jennifer morton you're next thank you i need a day man jesus christ my name is jennifer i am anishinaabe and it is traditional for my people to respectfully address myself to the public in that way so i just introduced myself to you in my tribal language um I am running for city council because I really want to use my voice for a positive impact to help enhance Montpelier for me and my family, the indigenous community and BIPOC community of Montpelier and my neighbors, and also to model for others the importance of sharing their voices. I want home ownership for those earning less than $40,000 a year, especially for working families and single moms. Um, I have lived in Montpelier for seven years uh, I've lived in the same apartment for seven years, and I will continue to live in this apartment until there is affordable housing in Montpelier. My children both go to school at uh, Union and Main Street Middle, and my husband um, is from Vermont. I'm from Southern California, and we chose to raise our children here because of how small the community is, and he had a great childhood, and I want my children to have that as well. Um, I have been working as a social worker for the last 20 years um, in Portland, Oregon, and here in Vermont. I've worked at the Washington County Youth Service Bureau, the Family Center, sorry, the Family Center of Washington County, and now I am the COSA coordinator at the Barry Community Justice Center. I, sent, I spent four years on the Vermont State Commission of Native American Affairs, and I'm really proud of the work that we did. And I really look forward to serving my community and being a voice for folks that live on the other side of the river and aren't homeowners. Um, and that's all. Miigwech. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. So uh, now we're gonna move on to the, the questions. And the introductions, when we were uh, doing the planning on this, we were debating whether two minutes was enough time for your opening remarks. So. We, and we were going to go to three minutes anyway, so we ended up fudging on the two minutes a little bit. On the um, on the questions, we do have a lot of questions, and there are four of you to answer. So uh, we would like it if you try to do a good job of, of sticking to the two minutes, and when you get the 30-second or 15-second um, warning, if you could, you know, try to wind it down. And you will have the opportunity, and you know, when you're answering other questions, there may be something you can uh, come back to that you didn't finish, and you can also do that in your closing comments later on. So in this next section, the candidates will have up to two minutes to answer each question, um, and candidates may use the full two minutes, or they can use less than that if they want to. They can pass on a question if they choose to. Uh, you've already seen the uh, timekeeper putting up reminders at 30 seconds and 15 seconds, and then at the end of the two minutes. And we'll continue doing that uh, through that. A reminder, if you'll, you won't know all the questions we have yet, but if there are questions that you want to put in chat, I can see we already have some comments in there. Um, if you want to put anything in chat, you can do that at any time. I'll give you a reminder of that in a little bit. but. Um, after the first two of the candidates answer this question, the, the first, well, actually, yeah, after the first couple questions, actually, will be to the midpoint of the of this part, and, and we'll have to close off questions. So in this section, for the first question, it, it will be uh, Jennifer, Leon, uh, Alice, and Carrie. That'll be the order. So the opening question for you, and these questions are all 
questions that were submitted to us um, uh, from the public after announcements of the of, of this forum. So uh, how would you go about understanding what district residents are most concerned about? Thank you. Um, you know, when I was going around getting um, signatures to run this first time, um, I made a promise to my neighbors that I would come back and if I was elected for real, um, that I would come back and spend time with them, um, you know, in a safe way. And that is my plan moving forward is to go around to as many neighbors as I can to actually have a talk to see what their concerns are, especially in my apartment complex. There's a lot of families that live here. Um, and my other plan is to um, I have my email available. It already is. I posted it on Front Porch Forum today and I welcome any kind of conversation from my neighbors. Um, I really wanna know what's important to them because I'm just a voice and I want to uplift my neighbors. It's not just about me, it's about everybody. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. So, uh, candidates, anytime, if you want me to repeat question, everybody gets the same question, but if you want me to repeat it, let me know. So, Gene, you're next. Well, I, I could spend hours on this one, but uh, I'll keep it brief. Um, the public communication, I mean, has to improve. For years, there's already been just a disaster in, in as far as you know, this, this internal issue with, with failing to communicate properly with, with residents, uh, getting out certain messages. I mean, just as an example, the website is, is not, it's very outdated, it's not very clear. So for me, as far as like, I, I've, being a CAN neighborhood leader, I, I think collaborating with CAN and the potential that CAN has to uh, really improve and, and engage with residents and neighbors uh, so then at least council members could then go to those can leaders and get valid information rather than going to thousands of people i've gone door to door i've talked to i i'm constantly doing public engagement and uh talking to to uh, many generations that have been here for uh, short term or long term um i want to implement a polling system, uh, a survey system. I want to implement a newsletter. I want to encourage uh, CAN to, uh, I want to visit CAN neighborhoods uh, at least four times a year and, and get together with those leaders. Um, a, a, a monthly newsletter I think is essential. Uh, of course, my email has always been available. It's a uh, I've sent out mailers to, to every uh, voter resident in, in this district. So most have my, uh, my information and, and, you know, and I'm, it, it's responding to the emails is essential. And uh, um, okay. So forth. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Well, thank you, Gene. Uh, time. Okay. Alice. Um. I, the way I would um, can you say that question so I can yes. answer it. How would you go about understanding what district residents are most concerned about? I would, I would speak, I'd speak with them and arrange, arrange a time that I'd be able to meet with them. Because I speak to a lot of, I speak to a lot of people uh, as working as working as a school crossing guard so I get to know their some of their feedback of um what they think yes mm -hmm. and I I would be willing to speak to to speak to the people and represent them as best as I can okay thank you Alice and Carrie yeah, um, so we have some great tools with the internet, with Front Porch Forum and social media and um, email. And so I would I would use all of those as much as I could. Um, but then I also think 
that hopefully we can find some ways to have some kind of gatherings, like it, it might be through Zoom, maybe as the weather gets better, as things get safer, it could be in person. So we can just have District 3 folks come together with the District 3 counselors and um, have just kind of some open discussions, share a cup of coffee, that kind of thing. Uh, but then also there's, you know, there are always people who are gonna be interested in connecting with city councilors, but there's a lot of people who that's just not gonna be on their radar at all. They're never gonna to think to reach out. They're not gonna look for our email and send us an email. And so I'd be interested in trying to find other ways to connect with the people in our community. And, and we have a lot of great community partners um, in Montpelier that we could reach out to folks like at you know, the uh, Community Justice Center, um, Another Way, Washington County Youth Service Bureau, schools, students, um, you know, that's really a voice that we don't get to hear too often. And so I would try to find ways to connect with those folks to get more information about what people's needs and desires are. Okay, thank you, Carrie. For the second question, well, the order would be uh, Jean, uh, Jennifer, uh, Carrie, and then Alice. And that question, um, maybe a little bit more difficult. So what would you want the city council to do about homelessness, housing insecurity, and access to affordable housing? Please share an example of a model housing development that you, um, that you would, that would have your support. So Jean. Yeah, a very good question asked and, and it's, uh, out there in a lot of people's minds it's a reality that we face and an issue that kind of became uh, really relevant a few years ago when uh, uh, the task force was established and I attended some of those uh, meetings and I did my own sort of outreach and research talking to actually uh, homeless in, in our community and, and uh, the importance of, I mean, it's a, it's a very challenging situation and we have to tackle it one person at a time. Luckily, it's, it's still small enough here where we can do that, but um, action is needed. We, we house homeless animals and treat them better than we do humans in, in, in certain situations. I mean, so there's a lot of ideas. We, we need first is a, is a location to provide there, so there's temporary solutions and there's long-term solutions. As a long-term, I'd like to see a site, a realistic site, uh, where we could develop, uh, there's the idea of pallet housing. I like the idea of uh, uh, tiny homes. Uh, so to, to give these folks uh, a place to charge a phone, a place to use a bathroom, a place to shower, a, a, a physical address. So then the social workers, the existing um, uh, departments could really associate, associate and help uh, each individual case. Um, having a residence is such is so valid and, and, and then we can go from there. On a, on a short term solution, there's been the talk and suggestion of, of insulated tents to get folks out, but we, we definitely need the public, a place for them, right now to put their belongings and uh, and have a public right. uh, bathroom for god's sake okay thank you gene uh jennifer thank you um so my work in oregon within the homeless youth continuum we had a there's an amazing programming out there that i think could absolutely happen here in montpelier where there would be one centralized location for folks to come and get wraparound services where there would be showers, food available, um, access to phones, storage, and ideally um, housing, because people need more than just a, a roof over their head. They need support. They need, you know, to regain the tools to be able to continue moving forward once that, you know, temporary situation is over. So I, I really feel that we need a one-stop place where folks can get all their needs met in one centralized location. All the social workers would be there. And um, I think it could be a really beautiful thing. And it could even happen at the old um, uh, building over on um, Berry Street. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. And Alice. 
I would I would want to I would want to see the council figure out a way how they can they can problem solve to address this matter. And the examples are many many of different options. It it can include public housing, mixed housing, tiny housing, village, villages. For example, Barry has two tiny houses. Okay. Thank you, Alice. Uh, for the third question, we'll uh, we'll start with wait, Alice, and it'll wait, be Alice. Oh, I'm Carrie. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Don't forget me. <laughs> um, that's okay. So I, much for my checklist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love Jennifer's idea um, of the place where lots of resources are concentrated. Um, I'm really interested in the idea of looking at the the current rec center, soon to be old rec center on Barry Street. Um, love that idea. And I think, you know, when a, this is not a question that really can be answered in two minutes, obviously, but some, some kind of key principles are, um, everybody's situation is different. People are, are homeless or insecure in their housing for all kinds of different reasons. And they, they have different ideas about what would be helpful to them. And so we, can, we can't get very far if we're just gonna make decisions for other people on their behalf. So we really have to find out what is it that you need? What do you want? What can we do to help you? Um, so that's a principle that I think we need to operate from all the time. And then there's the whole other question about uh, folks who have a place to live, but it's too expensive for them, or they, they need a bigger place, but they can't possibly get it. Or maybe they're renting and they'd like to own, but they can't possibly afford to buy a place because the housing has gotten so outrageously expensive in Montpelier. And so we need, obviously we need more housing and we need housing that people can afford to pay for. And there's, um, you know, what I'm really interested in finding out more about is what kinds of influence can the city have over uh, what sort of housing ends up happening here? And so, for instance, if somebody wants to, if a private developer wants to build an apartment building, what, where are the, the levers that the city can pull to say some of this needs, some of these units need to be affordable units, or some of these units need to be two or three bedrooms so that families can live here, and so that the kind of housing that is getting built in Montpelier expresses the needs that and the desires that we have for the kind of community that we have and that we want. And, and I, I need to know a lot more about this. I have a feeling that there's, from what I have learned so far, there's not a whole lot that the city can do about that, but I think that there are things that the state can do. And I think that there are collaborations that we might be able to influence to make some changes there. Um, and do I, am I out of time? You're out of time. But... <laughs> I don't see the timekeeper. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> okay, sorry, Carrie. So that I that I'm almost missed you. I would have missed you there. So, in the uh, for the third question, we'll, we'll have uh, Alice, Carrie, um, Jennifer, and Jean. And this the third question: What is your view on Montpelier's increasing property taxes? So, Alice, you get to go first on this one. I think the property taxes are really high for Mount Pillier. And um, I think we should look at other communities, how how their rate how they're rating their taxes. Because I think Mount Pillier is the highest highest um, tax in, in the whole state of Vermont. So that's about okay. Thank you, Alice. Carrie? Yes, well, obviously Montpelier taxes are really, really high. They're just so high and no one's gonna argue with anyone about that. And um, we are, uh, you know, there's a lot of complex reasons for that. Um, part of it was we're supporting an infrastructure and a city that serves a lot more than just the 7,800 or whatever it is who actually live here. And so um, I'm pretty interested in seeing if there are other ways to help support that. Um, I mean, I know that the city has found lots of other ways to support that beyond just the property taxes on its citizens, but that's the, the direction that we need to keep moving in. Uh, I'm, I'm very appreciative that we have the income sensitivity at the state level. I think that really helps a lot, a lot of people, but it's not 
is not enough. So anytime, I think when the city council is considering raising taxes, they need to understand who exactly that's impacting and how that's impacting them. So, um, and, and I'm not sure that that's always something we really, we really know. And so I think that's important. Um, I also think that we might have a lot more success if we start by asking ourselves, what is it that our community needs? And then figure out how to pay for that rather than starting from the point of how much money do we have that we can raise from taxes and what can we do with that? So it's, so it's, it's kind of a flipping the, the budget process around. And um, I think that we might do a lot better with that. Okay, thank you, Carrie. Uh, Jennifer. I'm gonna be real quick. I'm not a homeowner, so um, property taxes are uh, a new thing for me. I know nothing about them other than that they're extremely high here in Montpelier. And I've heard so many people um, share with me that it's getting to the point where a lot of people can't afford to live here anymore. And that really makes me sad because there's a lot of people that have invested their entire lives here and now there are elders and they're not able to keep up on their mortgages. So, you know, I really want to learn more about property taxes and what each homeowner's property taxes is going for. You know, I'm learning all this, this is brand new and I really want to learn from my community members. Um, also, if I become a homeowner, it will be a much more, um, well, it's already an, an important thing, but it will be even more important for me to understand what the things we decide on in city council, how they affect financially um, the members of the community. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Jean. Hi, so the one word to uh, answer that question is outrageous. Uh, I think we already know what the community needs as far as, you know, there's a lot of it. And, and of course, it's addressed in the budget and, um, you know, from decaying infrastructure to roads to affordable housing to keeping the departments, you know, the, the essential necessities to sustain the city. Uh, but th there is a long term, long time um, systemic issue, which is when something for a long period of time in a system doesn't stays the same or there's no improvement. And so from current to previous council members, these, these budgets continue to get approved. And, and rather than looking at it with realistic creative means to, to lower the taxes rather than, you know, there, there has to be uh, the time and the, and the energy to, to really emphasize on how we could reduce certain costs and waste, you know, those needs versus the wants. Um, it's like I, I get, if I get a call from a 80 year, year old uh, senior that lives in a 400 square foot home, why is she paying $3,800 in property taxes a year? She, so it's driving out a community. It's, it's making it least affordable. Um, it, it affects everyone who owns a property. And uh, now with inflation and the way the market is, market is um, it's going to get difficult if we don't carefully really examine, re-examine, reinvent, and uh, really reform. Okay. Thank you, Gene. Um, a reminder to people in the audience that you can be putting questions into a chat. And uh, I haven't read through all of them, but I've seen some questions in there that are not on our list of questions for tonight so far. So, you know, please, uh, com please com continue putting questions in uh, for the We'll be able to take them for a few more minutes um, so that we have a chance to compile them before we get to the second round. So for the next question, uh, we'll go with Carrie, Alice, Jean, and Jennifer. We'll do that order. And that question, this is the fourth question. Uh, what would you want to get the city council to do to improve the quality of life in your district? 
So Carrie. All right. So this was an interesting question because um, I feel like the quality of life is pretty great in a lot of ways. Um, and so I, the, so the question is what could make it a lot better? Um, and I think that there are, you know, I live in St. Paul, on St. Paul Street, which is like the weird little thumb of District 3, right? Most of District 3 is over on the other side of the river. And then there's mm -hmm. this little bit that kind of sticks into downtown. And so, um, so I'm really thinking about what are the things that are that are happening over there. And uh, traffic is a big one that comes to my mind. Um, I know that the folks on Berlin Street have, um, have been really wanting traffic to slow down. And it has, I believe it has slowed down. The speed limit is lower. Hopefully that has helped. Um, uh, traffic backing up from uh, uh, national life and trying to, you know, weave through neighborhoods that are not really designed to accommodate commuter traffic, but that are taking commuter traffic right now. I think that's something important to look at. And then also uh, general walkability of, uh, this is true for the whole entire city, but there are some parts of our city that have great sidewalks that are kept really clear and it's easy to walk around and lots and lots of parts of our city that don't, that'll have a sidewalk for a little while, while on one side of the street um, and then it disappears <laughs> and that, or you have to cross back and forth. Or, and so um, I'd really like to kind of take a look at that and think about how do we make that the, uh, uh, every part of Montpelier be a place that you can get around on foot um, and not have to rely on a car to get every single place. Okay, thank you, Carrie. Alice. You repeat the question? Yes, what would you want the, to get the city council to do to improve the quality of life in your district? I would want them to, to listen to the, I'd want them to listen to the people and hear what the people wanted and needed and try to come up with ideas of how we can make that happen. Like solutions, problem solving. Like, um, for an example, like with, with traffic. And I also find with, with, uh, um, with the four-way intersection, it's fairly hard for people to get in and out of Montpelier driving. There's a whole lot, lot of things I like to see different, like um, the clean cleaning. I see that um, poor cleaning in, in Montpelier with the snow cleaning, and I feel that these are big concerns that that the council needs to look at. And consider. Okay, thank you, okay. Alice. Oh, were you done? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jean, you're next. I think Alice made one valid point there. Um, councils cannot ignore the residents they rep represent. Simple as that. I mean, there's there's a, a lot of personal perspectives. In a, I can give you an example. Um, if, if 200 people in an area or 500 people, voters, residents in the community, want a sign yellow, and they go to council, they want this sign yellow. But a council member doesn't like yellow. He likes the white sign. So, he doesn't vote on the yellow because he likes white. But this isn't about him. It's not about personal perspectives. It's about the, the residents and, and what, what they're trying to say. So I, I was involved in a two-year, in a project here on Berlin Street to reduce the speed limit because that was the number one concern. It was extremely hazardous, Jennifer might know. And uh, I, it took two years for that to get on the table until I pushed and pushed it through. I went door to door, gave uh, 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 basically the, the, the hearing dates. So people turned out, hundreds of people turned out with data, gathering data, sharing their concerns and how hazardous, how dangerous to reduce the speed limit. Well, council members didn't vote on it, regardless, because some council members decided they couldn't. Uh, do that speed in this area where where other areas that were 35 at one point 
you know, in the, throughout the years, it was finally reduced. So, I mean, listening and really valuing the concerns um, to provide safety, uh, transportation. I want like to restructure the districts too, because the concerns in one district might be different than. Uh, okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Jean. Okay, and Jennifer. Um, the roads. I'm sorry. I love you, Montpelier, but the roads are atrocious. I don't know how many flat tires I've gotten. My neighbors have gotten. Um, and I know it's part of living somewhere where it snows and the roads get plowed and um, potholes get made. But the fact that there are so many massive potholes and I think about Phelps and how Phelps Street is just this frost heave, you know, it's just, it's, they're difficult roads to travel. And I feel like that that is something that we should absolutely center because it snows here and that's not going to go away. I also feel like traffic, you know, during rush hour, when schools are getting out, when people are leaving their places of business, we're, we're a small little city with a lot of people in it and the traffic issues are growing. They've grown over the years. So, you know, those are two things that I know that my neighbors have mentioned to me that they would like to see change that would make things a lot better for them. Um, and again, with the walkability, I think that is um, becoming more and more um, a concern for my neighbors. And I've talked to some of them about that as well. I love that the new walking path that, that opened recently. And I think that if we could extend that, you know, my kids like to walk downtown from this side of the river and I let them, but I let them with a gritting, you know, motherly fear that, you know, somebody's going to come flying through going up Berlin and, you know, nailing my children. So I really think that, again, thinking about the safety and the walkability and, you know, the speed limit on Berlin, just, just follow the instructions, please. You know, we all live here together and we all care about each other and it's not hard to do. Oh, I saw stop. Sorry. So I'm going to stop. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jennifer. I, I, I imagine that the people who are, are watching this at home are having the same reaction that I'm having, that sometimes I want to jump in too. It's like, and, 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 yeah. So that, uh, but these, these are good topics that, that people uh, brought up ahead of time. So the next question, uh, it's a, a complicated one, and it could have, uh, it has two different parts. I'll read it in just a moment. Um, even though we have a two minute limit, if you think this needs more, I, I'll uh, I'll be flexible on this. It's a it's a hot topic it's about the elk, elk's property, but in this in the, for this next question, um, it will be Jennifer, Jean, Alice, and Carrie. That would be the order we'll be going in. So uh, Jennifer, you'd be first. So the question is this, and it does have two parts. Um, if the bond issue for purchasing the elk's property passes. What types of uses would you envision for it? Or, and what kind of process would you propose for developing that vision? Part one. Or if it doesn't pass, what would you propose the city do about a recreational center that could better serve the whole community? So that's really, it's two, um, two big questions. So if you do need to go over two minutes, I won't be fussy, so. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, so if it passes, this is something obviously that we've been talking a lot about in city council and within the community. Um, if it passes, my hope is that, and this is what I have, am pushing for, and I push for the language to be changed on the bond for this, is housing. I, I think housing should be the priority. Um, I know that my council mates um, everybody has their own thoughts and their districts have their own thoughts, but housing is an issue here and it's going to continue to be an issue and there's not a lot of places to build on. So affordable housing, you know, they don't have to be these grandiose homes. We could do condos. We could do, you know, a mixed bag of, of, of housing and, and create a nice neighborhood for people to move into, to, to be homeowners and to be more invested in Montpelier. Um, I also think 
you know, having, I know there's, this is a hot topic, but having um, more places for people to be outdoors. I know we live in Vermont. I know it's a green, beautiful state, but you know, I live in an apartment and when I want to go out for a walk, I have to go to North Branch or, you know, other places. I don't, I can't just like walk around my, I live on a hill and a hill that continues to go up where it goes right down into the city. So having more green space for people to get away, I guess, even though the city's not big, um, that, that is my hope. If it passes that we will center housing. And as far as if it doesn't pass, um, I think we need to update the recreation center or have another space for our children to go to. My kids have been attending camps at the rec center and, you know, I know they try hard, but there's just only so much they can do. The building isn't safe. You know, if you're in a wheelchair, you can't access it. If you're on crutches, it's really hard to get around. Um, I really think that having another rec center somewhere for families and for, you know, everybody who lives in Montpelier to enjoy um, needs to be built somewhere. And that would be something that I would push for. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Jean. And again, if anyone wants me to read the question again, this is a long one. I'm happy to do that. This is a hot topic right now. And, uh, and, I, and I'd like to address this and, and why it's such a hot topic and, and councils approving to, to uh, put this bond on them is, is also just irresponsible in, in the sense where rather than putting it a questionnaire on the ballot as to if people kind of like they did with the hotel garage situation. I mean, rather than putting it on a bond, why not ask it in a questionable format? Uh, before we jump the gun with a, again, lack of communication and, and a lot of misinformation that's out there, um, the, the management has to do better in communicating and having better dialogue with, with the residents to, to be clear on explaining what the bond is um, uh, with, with details and with the um, potentials. So, I, I mean, I'm currently mixed on this topic. Um, I, if it does pass, it does definitely, I, I believe that the property could create with cre creative and responsible budgeting, it could create a, it could be self-sustainable. Um, if, if the part of the land could be leased for recreation, indoor tennis court. I think a part of it has to, you know, we need affordable housing. So, so the mixed use idea is great. And then another part uh, in, in, in thirds, so the would be recreation uh, use as well. My kids do attend the soccer camps at the rec fields. Um, I play basketball and sometimes a, our Barry Street Rec Center is is overly filled. It's 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 uh, not safe. Um, it's outdated. But there's been um, that's been addressed, and there's been public hearings, and and would cost just about the same amount as probably less to renovate that building versus building another one. So there's a lot of a uh, it's it's challenging, and and there has to be better dialogue and and. Uh, um, communication to to get the facts and, and and all the potentials for this property. Okay, thank you, Jean. Uh, Alice, you're next. Yes, if the bond issue for purchasing the Elks property passes, what types of uses would you envision for it, and what kind of process would you propose for developing that vision? Or if it doesn't pass. What would you uh, propose the city do about a recreational center that could better serve the whole community? Okay. My first answer is uh, more affordable housing, creating affordable housing, including people who are unhoused. That's one. And then if it doesn't pass, 
then look for other ways that um because I, I was thinking I was also thinking about the Barry recreational center and I was thinking well why can't they 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 use that to help the homeless or um uh, or the un, not homeless, I shouldn't use the homeless, the unhoused, people who are who are unhoused, and also, also see a, a way that they can they can also include recreational for the community. Because okay. um, in Mount Pelier, we don't Mount Philly doesn't have no place for um for people that are un, unhoused and low income and I uh, I sort of I sort of know about I sort of, I sort of know about what it's like for the people that aren't that are house where I talk I'm a school crossing guard and I talk to them and you know it'd be nice if they if they we could have something like that here in Mount Pelia for the unhoused and also maybe we consider how we can have a community set that for the community both. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Alice. Uh, Carrie. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm a big supporter of this purchase. I hope that it does pass. I think this is a really great opportunity for Montpelier to have some control over a nice big piece of land and therefore be able to have some say over um, what happens on it. And so if it does pass, I hope that we really take advantage of that and think about what is it that we most want to see there and try to make that happen? For me, affordable housing, as I think everybody else has mentioned, is really top of the list. And um, earlier we had a question about a model affordable housing development. And um, there's in the, the town where I grew up in Massachusetts has a, an intense housing crisis. And about 15 years ago, they um, got kind of innovative and they bought a piece of property at a, at a price that you know, somebody was trying to sell it at an affordable price and they built uh, a really beautiful development on it that's all um, affordable housing, but it does not look like your typical affordable housing. It looks like uh, townhouses. It's townhouses, it looks like condos. It's really, really beautiful. And it works because the city owns the land and they contracted with a private development company with experience in building affordable housing to build and manage the housing. And so, I'm really interested in finding ways that the city can work collaboratively, retaining some level of ownership, not just to sell it off and hope for the best, but to really enter, enter into a partnership to get the kind of housing that we actually want. And that kind of goes back to what I was saying before about finding ways to influence where we can. Um, our rec needs, I, uh, I mean, my kids have really benefited from rec center programs over the years. I would love to see something if we built like a big fancy pool, state of the art, that was a real draw from lots of other communities, that sounds really interesting to me. Um, but uh, another place that, um, uh, I mean, short of that, I think we have to be really thoughtful about where our priorities are and what we actually wanna put our resources into. So that's Okay, it. that wasn't a real stop, you know, but. Oh, oh, uh, sorry. That I was it, yeah. But that was, that was good. You saw the hot that. pink, and I just, you know. Yeah, I know. Okay. Water. Thank you. So, um, for the next question, will the order will be uh, Jean, Jennifer, Carrie, and Alice. And this question: um, What are the top three most pressing critical matters or currently unmet needs being faced by city residents? And how would you propose that the city best address these? So the question is asking about the three most pressing needs for the city and how you would propose addressing them. What are the, you, you, is that me? What are the three? Yes. Most pressing? Yeah, this one has two parts too. So yeah, what are the three top critical needs matters uh, and being faced by city residents, and how would you propose that the city address these? Short, city, slice. I'll try to keep the top three. Well, 
Yeah, top three needs top and how you'd address them. Yeah. Affordable housing, property taxes, we got homeless, we have a homeless issue in our town. Um, so all these, we discussed and we could talk about it in depth and in detail. Um, recreation is not on top of the, um, the, the traffic problem in this district, in this area, and the majority of the district is, is a, a major concern that I hear all the time. Um, and, and since uh, we helped reduce the speed limit here, um, it was promised that it would get back on the table. Well, that was three years ago and it still hasn't been readdressed. So we need to get that concern and, and issue taken care of right away um, because people, my kids also like to walk into town. People, um, it's hazardous, especially in the winter and especially people are flying through here. Ever since they opened the Fisher Bridge, this neighborhood had a two years of of actually feeling like a real quiet, calm neighborhood since they opened the Fisher Bridge. It's, it's the dynamics of this neighborhood has, has changed again. And it's just a shortcut to get to, to cross over to the next town. And, and, and people are just really speeding through here excessively. And, and so the enforcement that they promised hasn't happened. The specific lighting lights and, and uh, traffic calming uh, hasn't occurred. So safety um, is, is an essential getting the plan in action, immediate plan in action to address the homeless issue and responsible budgeting to help reduce taxes rather than increase taxes um, to improve our quality of life here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jean. Jennifer. Um, obviously my first thing is going to say, I'm going to say is housing, affordable housing, um, housing for our, um, unhoused community members, whatever that looks like. Um, although that will take time, there is not a quick fix for that. And I only say that because I've been working with houseless communities for over 20 years. I've been homeless. I understand that struggle and there is no quick fix. So we need to get a plan that is solid, that will work within our small town and will not raise property taxes in order to build something. Um, infrastructure, I, I, I am constantly reading about pipes bursting. And you know, I worked at the Washington County Youth Service Bureau when it was on Elm Street and it was in an old building and you know, there's flooding issues on Elm Street. And I just, you know, it, gives me a little bit of, you know, cringe, you know, thinking about how old the, the pipes are here. And, you know, I want to live here for until I die and I'm only 50. So we got to do something about the old infrastructure that we have. And I know that costs money. Um, and again, you know, I'm not a politician and I'm learning all of this. So I'm learning how to understand how things are, are paid for, for the city and how that affects the people that own homes in town and bonds. Um, I also feel like God, there's so many things, but um, affordable housing, infrastructure, and and housing our our unhoused community members. Those are the things that I feel like are really pressing right now. And property taxes are in there as well. But again, like I said, that's something I'm still learning, and I don't want to speak on something that I don't fully, completely understand. I don't want to make promises that I can't come through with so thank you okay thank you jennifer carrie yeah um i'm following jennifer around saying yes i i agree with that i'm echoing what jennifer's saying um yeah uh, uh housing and infrastructure are both huge and and the housing one is it's really tied to kind of the general affordability of our community and the kind of um uh, I think we have a real danger here. I think we're starting to see a dynamic of some significant income inequality happening. And um, people with a lot more money having an undue influence on the housing market and um, houses that are being bought for the purpose of renting them out as Airbnbs and not as um, places for families to live. 
And um, I'm really worried about that. I'm really worried about this. I feel like we're on a road to where this is, we're already starting to see problems. I'm afraid that's gonna get worse. And so we need to look at things like affordable housing, but we also need to look at, well, housing just is, for people who don't fall into that affordable housing category, it's still too expensive to buy a house here or to rent here for a lot of people. And so what is it that we, we can do to address that? And then that we have so many people who are living unhoused right now in Montpelier. I mean, this is something that's just so different than when uh, I moved here 20 years ago. And um, I'm not completely sure of all of the reasons why, but um, I, this is a really tough nut to crack and there are no easy answers. I've, see, I've seen other communities struggle with this and not succeed at solving it. Uh, but I, so maybe we have an opportunity to kind of get here in at the beginning and say, we don't want to be 50 years from now, we don't want to be a place where um, nobody who has a regular job can actually afford to live. And so what are we going to do about that? And I'll stop. My 15 okay. seconds left. <laughs> Thank you, Carrie. Alice. Um, the three, the three um, issues are affordable, affordable housing, unhoused, that includes unhoused, uh, the people that are housed, traffic is a big one, and, and, and lighting, because it's very hard to see it at, at night time. And the traffic, the traffic is like back, it's very backed up. As I, as I work as a school crossing guard, I see the traffic and and sometimes it's hard to stop the traffic where I have to use, I have to use my, my whistle, my electric whistle to stop the tra traffic as I was a school crossing guard in New York. With the un, with the unhouse, because I, I forgot um, in, one of my, in one of my answers, I would recommend housing first for them. And um, for example, a pathway. And to have relationship with with um with the people that are housed. That was part of my uh, my answer. I was trying to get that in to help to help them because I have I have helped I have tried to help the homeless people. I try to give them resources, so I guess that that's something that that could help that would help. But the traffic need. They need to do something about the traffic and the, the traffic light and the lighting is a big, is a big problem that needs to be considered. And we would have to problem solve that too, how we can make that happen. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alice. Um, we are switching into questions that have, have come in uh, through the chat box this evening. So we'll get to as many of these as we can. We won't be able to get to all of them, I don't think. But so for this next question, the order will be Alice, Carrie, Jennifer, and Leon. So, and some of these are, are essentially follow-ups to some things that have been addressed before or different versions of it. Um, what are your budget priorities? Recreation, affordable housing, school buildings, homelessness, water treatment plant, streets, and um, water and sewer mains. No, so just quite a list there, but essentially it's what are your budget priorities? So Alice, you're first on this. So um, look at the budget and to see how we can make, how we can, um, what we need for each for each area. So so that we can um we can be fair equal on the budget. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I guess that's it. Okay. Thank you, Carrie. Budget priorities. 
Well, so that list of things, I, I wouldn't cross anything off that list. Those are all important things yeah. that the city needs. Um, uh, the one that really leaps out is, this is our theme for the night, I think affordable housing is one that we have not really had as a top priority, uh, the, or at least not to the point where I think it should be. So I'd really like to see that move up to be a really direct priority for the council in the in coming years. Okay, thank you, Carrie. Jennifer. Like we're in an echo chamber. I'm gonna just keep going with affordable housing. It's it's the it's the base of of you know feeling safe is having a home. And um, Montpelier is a beautiful little place. And you know the first time I when we first moved here and the first Valentine's Day with the Valentine's Day bandit, my heart exploded. And I am not that corny of a person, but. I fell in love with this town because of that and I want to stay here and I want other people to stay here. So affordable housing and protecting our waters. Um, I'm an indigenous woman and, and a water protector. Um, it is something that's super important to me and you know, making sure that our water is safe and clean um, is also a priority for me. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Jean. Yes, I would not. Um exclude any any of those issues off the budget. I mean, the aging infrastructure is addressed in the budget. I, I think the, a lot of the issues currently lie in, in the departments and uh, there's, a, you know, and, and also looking at the post COVID reality, um, I think we have to reinvent ourselves as a city or, or weigh things out. Um, uh, Reducing taxes can help relieve um, the burden and, and can help create affordable housing for those who, who already have housing. Um, looking at, I think having also a private public engagement to all these uh, potential sites that have been on the table for years um, to, to really have a realistic engagement and plan to start developing these areas that have been vacant for so many years. And, and Sabin's Pasture is one of them. Uh, just uh, up here, the Berlin Street area, Northfield area, there's just it's already several locations. So, um, yeah. Um, also, in, in, in just as a follow up, I think in um, whether we, we get involved in, in purchasing lands for recreational use or mixed use, which I think is great for, for housing and controlling. The city does have a degree of policy for um, developing projects. So we do have a level of, of policy that could accommodate such possible um, developments. Okay, thank you, Jean. Uh, for the next question, we'll go with, uh, it'll be Carrie, Alice, Jean, and Jennifer. And we're getting on to some questions that aren't, that don't deal with money. Uh, maybe not. May, <laughs> in some ways, everything deals with money. But um, uh, how could you work with the city to encourage all of us to use our cars less, walk more, and use the public, trans use the public transportation more frequently? Great question. Um, so we talked a little bit about this earlier with sidewalks and I saw um, John Snell put in the chat that the city is working on chipping away at adding those sidewalks, which is great. Glad to hear that. Um, I, I think our, our public transportation, um, if it's really good, people are more likely to use it, you know? And so, um, and it's not, I think we have to be willing to, and I think we are doing this, to be willing to make the investments in stepping up the public transportation that's available and then attracting people to it and not wait for a demand for it. Um, because I think if it's there, it's a kind of, you know, if you build it, they will come, but it has to be good and it has to be, it has to be faster and, and easier in some cases than, than just hopping in your car. And um, I think the jury is, is out on this new pilot that we've got of the, the my ride, but I think that it's, it's promising. And um, 
So I think I, I think more investments in that. And uh, I'm not a giant fan of punitive measures to try to prevent people from using their cars, you know, like increasing parking fees or anything like that. That's just not general my approach. It, um, uh, I'm, I was, I'm, I'm not opposed to, to having um, additional parking for cars because people are gonna be using them while at the same time finding ways to encourage people to walk and bike and use public transportation more. I think we, you know, we kind of, we catch more flies with honey than with vinegar approach, I think is a good way to go here. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Carrie. Alice. Is that a question again? So th this is, how could you work with the city to encourage all of us to use our cars less, walk more, and use the public transportation more frequently? Well, the one way I can I can um, talk to the city council about having them use transportation is having um, better public transportation because with the my ride, some some people some people find it harder to get around with the my ride, like the, the older class of people. They have, they find it hard to get on the my ride where it was much easier when we had the, the Mount Pillar Hospital Hill bus and you didn't have to call up. And I feel that instead of them having this pilot program that they they just put on people, that they should they should have a survey or talk to the talk to the community about it. And another thing would be like to help with the biking, maybe biking, maybe um, maybe like carpooling could be another way, or uh, um, or walking. Those are different options. So there's a lot of different things that we can we can we can look at and bring to the table and see what what's how do what kind of solution can we make. Can we make this happen? You know, like I've been talking about problem solving, because that's the only way that we're going to be able to get to get a to get everything resolved if we work together as a group. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alice. Jean. Good question, and I'm a advocate for public transportation. I, I used to take public transportation since I was a child to school and high school for many years and even here when coming from living here and, and working in Shelbourne for a couple of years I, I really accessed the public uh, transportation system and, and all its routes and, and I spoke about this a couple of years ago heading like when they built the transit center I wanted to experience the the, the loops and I had to get to Northfield because my car was at the shop and, and I took the, the the bus out there and it was a great program it was amazing quick reliable and yet I was the only one in it <laughs> um, so there right now it's funny because I, I had a conversation with the my ride advisory group and even even though it's gotten some criticism uh, I, I think uh, the, of course things were affected because of COVID and the the pilot program that that's um, that's been initiated and, and in place with iRide I think it, it, from really um, just having these discussions about it I think it's something that could really be ideal and, and effective um, because it's going to act like our own community Uber basically and it could be accessible to everyone out of in your home it, you could be picked up in your house in your area and and it, it could be arranged just like an uber driver but so we have the means we have the access um it just we need better support and so um education you know uh just again public communication outreach and letting folks know that it's out there, it's available and, and so forth. 
Okay, thank you, Jean. And Jennifer? Um, I will say the one thing that I really miss about Portland and also when I lived in Boston was the public transportation. I didn't have car when I lived in those places um, and it was really easy to get around. And I wish that it was easier to get around Montpelier without a car, um, depending on where you live. If you live downtown, much easier to get around and, and to be on foot or ride a bike or roller skate or skateboard. But over here on this side of the river, it's a little bit more dodgy to walk around and there isn't really anywhere to walk around and only one side of the street has a sidewalk. Um, so I think that first we need to offer, offer folks some sort of incentive other than it's better for the environment because some people just love to drive and you're not gonna change their mind, but maybe if there's an incentive, um, I think safer sidewalks are, are necessary for people to be inspired to get out of their house or to get out of their car rather. Um, and then also having the public transportation being, you know, a little bit more accessible, go a few more places um, and not just to the hospital or, you know, when I was working with um, at the family center, a lot of my families that I worked with that lived downtown needed to get to certain places and they didn't have cars and it was really challenging to find them rides and I couldn't transport them because of COVID. So I think that we need to, you know, bone up on our, our public transportation a little bit and have a few more offerings for folks. And I think the MyRide um, program is wonderful. Um, we just got to work the kinks out. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. So we're going to be able to fit in one more question before uh, we give the candidates an opportunity to do closing remarks. I do want to mention two things. Uh, there have been a few references to the chat box. And if you haven't looked through there, it, it's interesting to, to scroll through to get some comments and questions. Um, and we, we can't get to all those things, but you can read through those to see what some of your um, fellow uh, citizens are, are commenting on and asking about. Also, after this next question, uh, we will put up a slide that, that provides the email address for the four candidates. They've all asked us to give you their email address so that if you want to follow up with them on any issues that you'll be able to do that. So we'll have that after the next question. And so for this uh, this question, the order will be uh, Jennifer, Jean, Alice, and Carrie. And uh, this question is, uh, what are your views on racial justice and how can the city contribute to this issue? Well, this is a, a big thing um, and there's no easy answer. And I think the way to start is to start talking about it openly, to start talking about the um, differences in our community and um, recognizing that not everybody in Montpelier is white. <laughs> And um, people that you think might be white aren't necessarily white. And I think having space for um, the, I don't like saying BIPOC and people of color, but for the community members that live here in Montpelier that are not from Europe or not Eurocentric folks, we need a place to be. And um, that's desperately lacking. And um, it's also kind of strange to me that it's lacking because this is the capital city of Vermont and it kind of blows my mind a little bit that there's not more space and and voice um, being heard in town and I know that Vermont um, is a very white state but it's not that white you just got to look around and open your eyes a little bit so I think we need to start having conversations about what the needs are of our community members um, that are not Caucasian it's a, it's a it's an awkward conversation to have, but I think it needs to be ha it needs to happen, and we need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable, and that's the only way we're going to be able to heal um, old wounds and move forward um, with equity. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Jean. Jean, you're you're muted still. Can you repeat the question? Yes. So this is. What are your views on racial justice and how can the city contribute to this issue? Well, 
again, communication and listening, proactive, the needs of the, the community as a whole, and, and not really looking at a, a color. You know, it's, it's uh, I've been a victim of, of police brutality and it was in, in racial profiling and, and in my youth. And um, so I, I have a lot of insight on, on some of this, but it's, uh, there's some, definitely some reform is needed in some departments. Dialogue and communication is always public engagement. Um, but, you know, we're all one race, I, I feel. I think uh, we're all Americans and uh, we, there's a lot of uh, division right now, in, in, unfortunately, in the world, in the, in the, in the country and things get politicized and weaponized and um, it's unfortunate and, and we don't necessarily need it in our community or, or have it in our community. I don't, um, if, if it becomes a, a, a problematic issue, then, then we as a community, we, we come together as you see in, in all the forums and, and dialogues and, uh, and, and there's always gonna be an open discussion. I think we're, we're we're proud of that here in Vermont. Of uh, even though we don't have a lot of diversity, it, it is there, and uh, and as as a whole, as a community, I, I feel like uh, we should all be considered as 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 a, as, as, a, as like a nation, a real nation, and not just uh, be divided in references to color or ethnicity or background. Okay, thank you, Jean. Um, Alice. Yes. Uh, what are your views on racial justice? And how can the city contribute to this issue? My views about, about racial issue, issues, racial justice. Um, With the, I, I have known some people to be discriminated because of their their color. How how the police, the police, um, I wouldn't say mistreat them, but like look at them differently, and that's a big issue. Um, where the, where the the council, the city can can work with the police department. But there's also not just racial, there's racial justice, um, there's discrimination against the disabled, there's discrimination against, against um, that people that are elderly, there's a whole bunch, but, but like I know that um, with racial discrimination, because it's a big, it's a big topic and a big issue, especially what happened with um, George George Floyd, but um, in Mount Pillar, I don't, I don't see it as, as much as I as I see it elsewhere. But I I sh surely can see, can see that we can. There's ways that the community can come together, support one another. Because like like Eugene said, we we're all the same. We are all the same. Yes, and we can come together and work together as one. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alice. Thanks, and Alice. Thank you. And Carrie. Yeah, um, I think we have a lot of work to do in this area. I think, um, I think Vermont in general has a really, really big problem around race. And um, I don't think that Montpelier is a whole lot different from most other parts of the state, but I have, um, you know, I think uh, we like to say that Vermont is a very white state and yeah, by some measures that's true, but it's not nearly as white as it used to be. And it is not nearly as white as people think it is. And um, the reality for a lot of people of color who live here is, I mean, I have heard people tell me that this is, they've experienced more and worse racism here in Vermont than any other place that they've lived in the US. Uh, I had a conversation with a traveling nurse one time, um, a black man from 
maybe Kentucky, I'm not sure. And he was like, I've never seen anything like this. And, and he was in Montpelier. So I think there's a lot that, that um, you know, that we don't, that we white people don't necessarily see. And so um, we need to really talk to each other and listen and believe our neighbors when they tell us about the discrimination that they're, that they're facing. And I have, I have heard some really amazing, horrible stories about uh, racism in Montpelier that I think a lot of our Montpelier neighbors would be shocked to hear because they just think, well, that doesn't really happen here um, because we're not, we're not tuned into it. We're not seeing it. So what the city can do about this, I mean, that's it. There's, I don't have a pat answer to that. I think it's a lot of hard conversations. It's a lot of hard work. It's sticking with it. It's not something where we can say, we did a study, we hired a consultant, we had a process, we did some trainings, now we're done. It's, it's, it's not gonna be done. It's just something we have to, to keep working at and keep being, being willing to be uncomfortable, as Jennifer said. Is key. Okay, thank you, Carrie. So um, someone asked that the uh, candidate's email addresses be put in chat. So our Zoom manager, Laura, took care of that, put them there. Um, are we still gonna put up a slide? We, yeah, we can still put up a slide um, that has the email addresses. So if that's easier for anyone. Um, okay, we'll put this up for a minute. And then we'll, uh, so this is also in, in the chat box. And we'll, we'll leave. The, don't want to wait too long because we, we want to make sure we have time for the candidates to do the closing remarks. So what we can do is we can also put that up at the end so that if anybody wants to, if you didn't uh, get to copy down something you wanted, we'll put it up at the end. So, but um, right now for the closing remarks from the four candidates, the order again will be Jennifer, Jean, Alice, and Carrie. And we ask you to try to stick to the two minutes because we're running right to the wire here. So Jennifer. I'll be less than a minute. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for um, attending and participating and asking really amazing questions. Um, and I appreciate the fellow District 3 folks for showing up and for being you know, present for this entire thing. I just wanted to say that my diversified background and experiences would enrich and broaden the council perspective. I think they do in the short amount of time that I've been on there. In my culture, in the Anishinaabe culture, it's of utmost importance that we carry ourselves in a good way. And for my role as a city council person, that would mean that I would be a respectful team player, a careful listener, and a problem solver. And I seriously can you know ask my constituents and neighbors to reach out to me, and I will try to get back to you all in a timely manner. But I have two kids and a full-time job, so give me a little room. <laughs> Thank you. Miigwech. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Jean. Yes, I'd like to thank everyone for all the participants who attended and for all the, the great questions they submitted. Um, I want to thank Ken again for putting this together, its first uh, annual. Um, and uh, again, you know, my uh, I think we discussed a lot, it's, and it's very important, all the topics. Um, and, and I want to say, like, this isn't, I've emphasized this before, this isn't politics, it's, a, it's management for the city. And, and I think uh, with my involvement here in the community, um, the public engagement that I've had, my experiences, my, my uh, education, um, diversity and, and the care and, and long time love that I've had in this area um, makes me a valid candidate. And, uh, and the fact that, I, I mean, I, I think there has to be some reform, level of reform um, from a lot of the issues and the frustrations uh, that I constantly hear all the time. And, it, and it, it shouldn't be ignored. It's out there. You can read it, feel it. You could sense it, um, and it's ignored, and and it starts with you know proper dialogue, 
and information is it, it's the, the budget uh, and our taxes and affordable housing and everything in it. So I thank you again. Um, and I hope everyone gets to vote. Thank you, Jean. Um, Alice. I would like to thank um, thank Cam for uh, making this happen, and thank thank you, Tom, for for all your support. And I'd like to thank the people for their questions. And I'd like to um, thank them. And I I want to do my best for them. And um, and I'm happy to be in District Three to support to support each other. And I, I really I really like work. I really like being in in Vermont, Malvilia. I'm from I'm from the Bronx. I'm from the Bronx, New York. So I really like it here a lot. And I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that um that I'm able to share my experience. Cause I used to be a school cross guard in New York. So I've been able to share my experience by taking taking responsibility for the children in Mount Pelia. So thank you again for thank allowing you. me to protect your children. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. And Carrie. Well, uh, thank you to everybody for organizing this. Thanks to CAN. I, I, we have such a fantastic resource in the capital area neighborhoods, and I'm so glad um, to see how active this is. And um, so thanks for pulling this all together, and thanks to the other candidates for being here. This has really been a fascinating conversation. I loved hearing what everybody else had to say. I loved seeing the uh, range of questions that went by in the chat. And um, this has really been very educational and fascinating for me. So thank you so much for the opportunity to be part of this. And um, I am I'm hopeful that I will get to continue to be part of these conversations in the future. Thank you, Carrie. This concludes the Montpelier City Council District 3 Forum. On behalf of Capital Area Neighborhoods, I'd like to thank the City of Montpelier and the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition. I would also like, the four, like to thank the four candidates for stepping up to run for City Council and for being here this evening. It is difficult to run for office and it is difficult to serve in office and we appreciate all of you for that. Thank you, Carrie Brown, Alice Goltz, Jean Leon, and Jennifer Morton. And lastly, I'd like to thank all who attended this forum. Your involvement and your vote are essential to making democracy work. Please vote on or before town meeting day, which this year is on March 1st. The only real democracy, democracy is participatory democracy. Thanks everyone, have a good night. Thank you.